I want to I want to continue in our series this morning. Both of my boys had an experience growing up that most people don't have. One that I cannot say I always fully appreciated because it was something that frankly I never dealt with. I I I say that the experience they had is this. They were preacher's kids. And I think there are, there are burdens that come with being a preacher's kid. And I see that now more than I used to. But my hope is that they look back and they, they think, you know what, there was a lot of benefits to being a preacher's kid as well. Although some of the perceived benefits, I remember having to correct them. For instance, my My youngest son, Jacob, was a little guy, and and he would think that I was the boss of this church. And when I first came here, I had to let him know that is not true. Betty Wells, my secretary, was the boss of the church. And of course, we all know now that Shannon is the boss. My hope would be that that Jacob, thinking that I was the boss, wouldn't have spilled over into him telling a a teacher in Sunday school or in one of his classes, I don't have to mind you. My daddy's the preacher. You see, our sinful nature's bent toward defiance shows up very early. The bigger problem is that it never tends to go away. So let me ask you this morning. When is the last time that you told somebody, I don't have to mind you? Now, maybe you did not use those words, but you had the thought in, and you've had it more recently than you think. Maybe, maybe the doctor has made it clear that there are some things about your lifestyle that you honestly, you have got to change. But deep down, you think, I don't have to mind you. Maybe you're driving down I-235 and that speed limit sign says 60 miles per hour, but you decide 75 miles per hour is a little more your style because in your heart you're thinking, I don't have to mind you. Maybe your spouse asked if you could take out the trash and clean off the table and inside there's just something that wells up and says, I don't have to mind you. When is the last time you said it to God? In the last couple of messages in this series on the life of Solomon, we have been examining his spiritual deterioration. And what we're going to do this morning is consider what this rebel ruler reaped. Josiah read so eloquently for us at the beginning of our service this morning from Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I like the same verse from the New Living Translation. It it is rendered, do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So I want to begin with a very important principle. Write this down. There is a cost for anyone who mocks God. Now, Paul said, God cannot be mocked. He doesn't mean that you cannot mock God. You can mock God. We see people do that every single day. People mock mock God. When Paul says that God cannot be mocked, he does not mean that you cannot do it. He means you cannot do it without consequence. You cannot ignore God and get away with it. No one reaches a status that they can say to God, I don't have to mind you. I heard a story of a woman that had to take a bunch of donuts to her child's class. It was her day to provide the treats, so she bought a dozen donuts. And she knew her husband loved sweets. But she put them on the counter in the kitchen. She put a note taped on the top of the box of donuts, and it said, do not touch. Well, he walked in smelled the donuts, opened the box up, ate two donuts. And then he wrote on the note, think metric. Lean over to your friend and explain that one to him. Here is the point. We all think, I get to change the standards. 
But God does not change his standards for anyone. And you know, Solomon should have known that just from studying his own father's life. Even King David, son of Jesse, ruler of Israel, could not ignore God and get away with it. Today, I want you to understand Solomon's problem was not one of ignorance. It was defiance. He knew God's warning in Deuteronomy 17 that the king is not to multiply horses, not to multiply wives, not to multiply gold, but he did it anyway. He knew God's decree in Exodus 34 verse 16 that the people of Israel were not to take wives from the Canaanites, but he didn't think that he had to mind that. And do you think when he built all those altars to those other gods that He did it because he had never read the first two commandments. Solomon's sin wasn't all of his multiple marriages or even his idolatry so much as it was that internal fist doubled up and raised toward heaven that said, I'm the king. I don't have to mind you. But whose arm is long enough to box with God. God is gracious, but God is also righteous. And God will not allow his name to be mocked with impunity. So we're going to look at chapter 11 of 1 Kings. Go ahead and turn there. Chapter 11, beginning in verse 9, we read these words. The Lord became angry with Solomon Because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. You cannot ignore God and get away with it. So what did the rebel ruler reap? Two things I want to show you this morning. First, write it down. Defiance jeopardized Solomon's dynasty. And when God promised that he would not tear the kingdom from Solomon until after his death, God did decide to give Solomon an immediate taste of what it was that was coming. And so what God did in the last years of Solomon's life was he raised up an external threat and an internal threat to his throne to give Solomon a taste of what the harvest of his sin was about to be. We're going to look at a couple of longer texts together, but follow along with me. 1 Kings 11, beginning in verse 14, the text reads this way. Then the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary, Hadad the Edomite, from the royal line of Edom. Earlier, when David was fighting with Edom, Joab, the commander of the army, who had gone up to bury the dead, had struck down all the men in Edom. Joab and all the Israelites stayed there for six months until they had destroyed all the men in Edom. But Hadad, still only a boy, fled to Egypt with some of the Edomite officials who had served his father. They set out from Midian and went to Paran. Then taking men from Paran with them, they went to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave Hadad a house and land and provided him with food. Pharaoh was so pleased with Hadad that he gave him a sister of his own wife, Queen Taphanes, in marriage. The sister, Taphanes, bore him a son named Ganubath, whom Taphanes brought up in the royal palace. There, Ganubath lived with Pharaoh's own children. 
While he was in Egypt, Hadad heard that David rested with his fathers and that Joab, the commander of the army, was also dead. Then Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me go that I may return to my own country. What have you lacked here that you want to go back to your own country? Pharaoh asked. Nothing, Hadad replied, but do let me go. And God raised up against Solomon another adversary, Rezon, son of Eliada, who had fled from his master, Hadad, uh, Hadadezer, however you say that one, that one, that one just got me, king of Zoba. He gathered man, men around him and became a leader of the bands of rebels. When David destroyed the forces of Zoba, the rebels went to Damascus, where they settled and took control. Rezon was Israel's adversary as long as Solomon lived, adding to the trouble caused by Hadad. So Rezon ruled in Aram and was hostile toward Israel. Now, I know that's not the most exciting text that you have ever read in Scripture, but there are some real nuggets in here that I want you to see. First, notice this. Notice that the adversaries of Solomon were no match for David. When David was on his throne, these guys were out of the way. But also notice this. This is even more interesting. Do you remember how all of this started? What was Solomon's very first compromise? How did the downward path begin? You see, Solomon decided something was necessary that David never did. He made an alliance with a foreign king in marriage. Who was that king? Pharaoh. Isn't this interesting? Solomon said, if I'm going to be a major player on the international stage, then I better make an alliance with a major country. So I'm going to marry Pharaoh's daughter and then Egypt will be on my side. Okay. Who became the chief financial supporter of Solomon's adversary? Pharaoh. Did Solomon's compromise accomplish what he hoped it would accomplish? You see, you hop into bed with the world and you find out the world will betray you as quick as it possibly can. Notice one more thing. Isn't it ironic that Solomon, the mightiest man on earth, the mightiest king on earth, the most famous man in the world, and there are two dinky little rebels out in the desert that he can't deal with. He can't eliminate them. There's a reason, because in both cases, it says in the text, God raised up. Solomon is getting a taste of what it's like to box with God. Now, that's the external threat, but let's read about the internal threat. Continuing, continuing in chapter 11, beginning in verse 26, it says this. Also, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials, an Ephraimite from Zerida, and his mother was a widow named Zeruah. Here is the account of how he rebelled against the king. Solomon had built the supporting terraces and had filled in the gap in the wall of the city of David, his father. Now, Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he put him in charge of the whole labor force of the house of Joseph. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country. And Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. It's kind of rude if you ask me. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. He will have one tribe. I will do this. Because they have forsaken me and worship Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in my ways, nor done what was right in my eyes, nor kept the statutes and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him ruler all the days of his life. And for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who observed my commands and statutes, I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. 
I will give one tribe to his son, so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will rule over Israel as king. If you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commands as David, my servant, did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Now notice, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled. Where did he flee to? Egypt, to Shishak, the king. And he stayed there until Solomon died. And I find it very ironic that all of Solomon's troubles began by thinking... I'll compromise with Egypt to protect my throne. And Egypt became the financier that helped bring his throne down. Now, it's ironic to me that Solomon's name means peace. Yet Solomon spent the last days of his reign dealing with great turmoil. Solomon immediately recognized Jeroboam as a threat to his throne. Throne. You go all the way back to the first message I began in this series, and you'll remember when Solomon was coronated, there was a threat to his throne then. It was David's son Adonijah, his half-brother. And Solomon eliminated Adonijah because God was with Solomon. Now Solomon has a threat to his throne, and Solomon can't deal with it. He's got more power now. He's got more influence now. But he cannot get rid of this threat. Why? Because God raised him up. God's favor is no longer with Solomon. God is not blessing whatever Solomon touches. So how did Solomon spend the last days of his reign? The greatest man on earth is spending sleepless nights, fretting and worrying, unable to get rid of his rivals doubting that his son, Rehoboam, is going to be any match for the challenges that will face him. God's plan was for David to rule for generations over the 12 tribes of Israel. And in just one generation, Solomon forfeited that dream. You see, defiance jeopardized his dynasty. One more point, write, write it down. Defiance minimized his legacy. At his ascension, the horizon was bright. But Solomon is not remembered for his first years of his reign. He is remembered for the end. He isn't remembered for the brightness of his ascension, but the darkness of his decline. I want to show you again what God said to Solomon when he was a young king that night when God said, I'll give you whatever you ask for. And Solomon asked for wisdom and God was so pleased. First Kings three, beginning in verse 13. God said, moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor. So that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David, your father did, I will give you a long life. So God said, I'm so pleased that you want wisdom to rule my people. I'm going to give you, if you walk in my ways, riches and honor and a long life. Well, I don't think any honest reading of Scripture would question the judgment that Solomon squandered the honor that God had so graciously given to him, it is clear that the biblical witness is one that diminishes his honor. What about his wealth? He was the wealthiest man on planet earth. Well, look at 1 Kings 14 with me. 1 Kings 14, beginning in verse 25, it says this. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. This is just five years after Solomon died. 
And, he, and look who it is that comes and takes all this wealth. Egypt. He lost his honor. He lost his wealth. And not only that, we know that Solomon was very young when he became king. Most scholars would assume that he was around the age of 20, maybe a little younger. It says that he reigned for 40 years, so that means that Solomon died right around or just before the age of 60. And in that day and age, for a man of his stature, that would be considered young. God said, I will give you honor. I will give you riches. I will give you a long life. Solomon squandered all three. He even sowed the seeds for the destruction of his life's greatest work. The thing that he did that was above all the things that he did, he built the temple of God. And it was the most magnificent building on planet Earth. But a few hundred years later, God would send in the Babylonians and they would literally destroy Israel. And what was the sin that destroyed Jerusalem? The sin of idolatry. The sin of worshiping other gods. And who planted the seeds for that destruction? And they came and they so destroyed Solomon's temple that to this very day, not a single remain of it has been discovered. His life's greatest work, completely obliterated by the seed that he had sown. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Let's see how his life story is summarized. 1 Kings 11, beginning in verse 41, we read these words. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the annals of Solomon? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Then he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. I find that an intriguing life summary. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did, what did he do? It doesn't tell us. I mean, I'm sure that they made headlines. Don't you think that everything that Solomon did, all the things that he built, all the ships that he bought, all of the, all of the alliances that he forged, don't you think those would have made massive headline events all throughout his reign. But the Holy Spirit sums it up like this. All that other stuff he did, it's in the book of Solomon, which, by the way, God did not even see fit to preserve for us. God didn't even think it was worth mentioning what Solomon did with most of his life. Isn't there something there for us to think about as we ponder our own legacies? All of this because his heart turned away from the Lord. So here's what matters most. What matters most is guarding my heart. Your heart is what will be remembered more than anything else. And by the way, that's not just my opinion. Solomon himself said that. Many of the Proverbs were, were penned by Solomon including this one, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Look at this verse, because it's interesting, from other translations, from the New Living Translation. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Or how about from the New English Translation? Guard your heart with all vigilance. For from it are the sources of life. And, and the one that I believe comes closest to how it's rendered in the original language is this one. The complete Jewish Bible says, Above everything else, guard your heart, for it is the source of life's consequences. You will reap in life what you sow in your heart. And that's why we should always pray the prayer that 
Solomon's daddy prayed in Psalm 86, verse 11. The latter part says, Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I want to do something we've never done before, and we probably should do this regularly. I'm told back in the ancient Greek Olympics that there was an event that was rather unique. Runners raced with a torch, and the winner was not the person that finished first, but the person who finished with his torch still lit. Two words the Lord has put on my heart recently. I think about them more and more as I'm getting older. The two words, finish well. I know too many Christians who have fallen out on the last lap. I think about some of my spiritual heroes when I was a baby preacher. And several of them have dropped the baton and they've even fallen out of the race. Solomon is a warning that you can start so well, but finish so poorly if you do not guard your heart. And I want to finish well. And I know you do as well. So here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do this. We mainly focus our prayers for the younger to grow in their, their knowledge of God and their faith and their walk with the Lord. But this morning, I want the younger to pray for the older. So if you are over the age of 60, would you please stand where you're at? Now, if you are under the age of 60, I want you to look around. I want you to see these folks that are standing, and I want you to go over to them, and I want you to respectfully place your hand on them, and I want you to pray over them. I want you to pray for the purity of their heart. Pray that they will finish well. Pray that they will pass to their children and to their grandchildren, a legacy of ending well. And after a few minutes of this, I will close out our time. So go get around somebody that's standing, and uh, let's get ready to pray over them together.